Handy filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, we're talking about the scariest things to befall your camera. Plus, your questions about the hidden mic technique, interlaced video, and putting Nikon lenses on Panasonic cameras. Griffin, you Happy. had fun with that intro. <laughs> Holy cow. That took well, me back a little bit. <laughs> it's almost Halloween. Mm. I see. I see. Yes. This will be and, uh, our our episode before our Halloween. Yeah. This is episode mm-hmm. 39 of the Hey Indie Filmmakers podcast. Uh, and you can't see this right now, and our listeners can't see this, but for those watching on YouTube right now, they can see that I have kind of a crazy white balance situation going on. Oh, Okay, I've I've put a red gel on my primary LED light, so I look pretty orangey right now. Very spooky. And I've kind of white balanced in a weird way, so my whole room looks blue. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just for fun, just to mess around a little. Yeah, I messed with a few different ones. Like one of them looks really green and weird, and uh, I think I I almost went too far with the red light. Like my camera couldn't quite white balance for it. Well, now I feel boring. I just have regular old <laughs> yellow light. Oh, well. You know, I should probably... Th- I don't know if people are going to be able to stand this for the whole podcast, so I think I'm going to tear down this red gel and go back to normal lighting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get this out of here. Oh, now my shot looks really blue. Good. So let's go to, like, a normal white balance setting. <sighs> this is just tremendous. This is tremendous. <laughs> And I also, I, I guess I don't use gels a lot. I noticed the gel also knocks down the, the brightness intensity, a lot. Of course, yeah. Like, yeah. I think it maybe cut more than half of the light out. Yep, that's what you'd expect. Cool. That's pretty normal. <laughs> so what well, scary things can happen to my camera, Griffin? Don't Don't scare me like that. Well, so, I mean, it's not the most exciting topic to talk about, uh, but we actually have gotten a lot of questions about insurance. Good, good. It doesn't sound exciting, but I think that uh, people should think about whether their camera gear is insured and the kinds of things that could happen. If only we knew somebody who had an associate's degree in insurance. Yeah. (laughs) I do have an associate of general insurance degree. (laughs) Although I don't know if I remember much of that. I'm sure you do. You're very clever. (laughs) So... Here, let's just start with uh, with a question that we got from Chris, who says that he just updated from the GH4 to the GH5 this week because cool. a local video house asked if I could supply them a rental unit from time to time. I was happy to oblige. I should probably put insurance on it. He says, you and Nick mentioned camera insurance briefly in a previous episode about adding it to your homeowner's policy. Can you go into more details? And what's your line of thought when renting out gear? Hmm. Yes, How did I you mean- never. I've never rented gear. No, me either. But it's probably a good way to put your investment in a camera to to use when you're not using it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I suppose, you know, if you're you're not renting it often, if you're just renting it to one rental house every once in a while, perhaps they're willing to take on all of the risk. Mm -hmm. If they break it, then they know they buy it. Maybe you don't even need to insure for them necessarily. But I think it's probably smart, especially if you have a big investment in your gear, to carry some level of insurance, right? Right. Well, and here's here's the thing I think about is, you know, some some insurance like homeowners insurance is often mandatory if, if you know the bank owns your house. Car insurance is usually mandatory, but for other things that we're allowed to insure, you can also self insure. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's actually how I deal with most of my equipment. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing well enough through my freelance business that I feel like if I were to lose a camera or something, I could just buy a new one. Right. And so I don't necessarily, you know, you would have to do the math. It's like if I am spending a few hundred dollars every year to insure my stuff, if I spend that money for 10 or 20 years and I never have a loss, then I really just wasted money right yeah well tell me if this is correct but i would be from an insurance perspective i'd be more concerned about a liability right when you're out on a shoot and set up light stands and somebody trips over it and they sue you or something right can you carry insurance for that yeah that's the that's the big thing i should probably do i don't have liability insurance right now but when i think about 
so I, I think with insurance, you have to think less about what happens, you know, if one camera gets dropped and broken or stolen. Like you can probably recover from that if you're if you're working and making money off of this stuff. But the reason you would have insurance is not for the little things; it's for the catastrophic failures that destroy your business. So, if my entire apartment burned down and I lost everything, I might still be okay. I, I might be able to <laughs> come back from that. But yeah, if someone trips on my gear and suddenly I'm on the hook for hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills or something, that's something that could destroy my business sure. and really mess me up. So what kind of policies are out there to protect against that? Well, your your standard homeowner's insurance or even renter's insurance has liability built in. And liability is the only thing I've ever been asked, like, to prove that I have. Sure. Uh, in fact, this this relates to our, our next question that we got from Mark Henry Cooney, uh, a YouTube comment. He is going to shoot some ads for business in his city, and he says that they are requiring liability insurance. Uh, do you did you ever need liability insurance for any of the weddings you shot? I've been asked about it. I never had it, and it never stopped me. But I did. Very rarely, but occasionally, at, was asked. You know, was I bonded or did I did I carry insurance? Yeah, I I was asked once for a wedding. It was like the wedding venue cared. Yeah, exactly. You know, That's what it was. It was the reception hall. Yeah, they want to make sure you don't destroy their beautiful place with yeah. your big light stands or whatever. But I I remember at the time thinking like, I'm not going to do anything. I don't even like bring light stands, and you know the the most I bring is like a tripod. Like, sure. What are the odds of that knocking? over and breaking something or hurting someone probably not a lot of risk there but uh, they did want this particular venue uh, wanted a million dollar liability coverage and I had home insurance at the time because I had a house in Illinois and do you want to guess what my liability coverage on the house was uh 100,000 it was 300,000 yeah but yeah, they, uh, you know, just by having homeowner's insurance or even renter's insurance, they'll cover you to some level of liability when you leave your house. Maybe you get into trouble, get sued. Uh, they'll cover a little bit of that. But so I asked my, my agent, like, can we up it to a million dollars? And really, I don't even need it to be a million dollars for more than one day. Yeah. Can we? And I feel like the, the cost to do that was something like five or ten dollars. <laughs> so you just did it and you were done? Yeah, I mean, you figure I pay all year round. My my home insurance was something like fifteen hundred dollars a year. It wasn't a very expensive house. Yeah. And if it costs fifteen hundred for all year to protect you against the threat of storms and 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 a little bit of liability on the side, it's really not much to add just a little bit more liability. So why not look at a year long policy just to a blanket liability coverage for for your business? I mean, yeah, I, I'm certainly at a place now where 100% of my income is coming from my business. I probably should look at getting liability coverage because it's not just the days that I'm shooting that I might be at risk. Someone could trip over my stuff. It could be that someone feels like I slandered them in a video and uh, and tries to sue me. or Yeah, I, I feel know, like some... you slandered me and actually I do have a lawsuit pending. <laughs> So you, should, <laughs> you might want to get some insurance. All the all the outtakes I've played of you at the end of the podcast make uh, you <laughs> yeah you've ruined you've sullied my good name. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of stuff I wouldn't know is coming, but you know could happen on any day or you know. So maybe I, sh I should look into some liability insurance. But it may not cost that much because the risk is not that high. Small. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, too, what about when you're traveling overseas? You know, does that affect your insurance coverage as well? Well, so we should talk about you can you could obviously go out and buy a special policy just for cameras. I mean, there's plenty of people that, that offer this kind of stuff to protect your stuff. But you should at least first look at what you have, what you may have currently. You and I both have renter's insurance. Yep. And... I looked, in fact, we both have State Farm Insurance. Like a good neighbor. <laughs> State Farm is there. Thank you. It took you a second. Jeez. <laughs> Today's podcast well, brought to you by State Farm. 
No. No, I see. Really. I, I not really. I, I hesitate because I didn't want anyone to think that we were sponsored <laughs> by my <laughs> former employer. Oh yeah, you used to work for them. That's right. <laughs> so I'm I'm looking at my 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 State Farm renters policy here, and let's see. I have only. What is it? I used to have three hundred thousand liability on my homeowners insurance. Now I have a hundred thousand liability on my renters insurance. I have the same. Yep. So not a huge amount of liability. I probably should up that. And then they'll cover up to forty five thousand dollars of property damage. Okay. So yeah, if my if my whole apartment burned down, then yes, I would have up to forty five thousand dollars to buy new camera equipment, new clothing, all that stuff, which may not get me very far. <laughs> yeah, I'm better than nothing though, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I did look because a lot of policies have, you know, they may say like, well, we can only cover you up to $2,000 of jewelry, for example. Right. Or, you know, only $200 worth of cash. You can't say that I had $50,000 of cash sitting in my house <laughs> and need all of that back. And I was surprised to see that the policy didn't have a restriction on camera equipment. Yeah. We're, uh, I, want, I mean, I wonder, do they ever get you? For, oh, that's business stuff and that's not covered under a... You know, home policy? That's where they get you, yeah. They don't have a specific provision for we don't cover that much camera gear. They do have a provision for we don't want to cover that much of your business stuff. Yeah. So if this is your primary business, which it is for me, uh, and I'm making enough money every year that they would consider it a business, then they're not going to they're not gonna cover all that. I think they'll cover up to 2,000 or something. Okay. So you do need, you do need a little bit more coverage. Right, yeah. I would want to get special coverage for that. I remember when I was living in Illinois and I was just doing this on the side, I actually asked my agent at the time, you know, my my homeowner's insurance covers a little bit. Do I need uh, to get a different policy for the camera stuff? And he actually asked me how much money I make Mm. on the with camera stuff and at the time it was low enough. He was like, no, it's not going to fall under that provision. So you're you'll be okay. But now you're rolling in the big bucks, Griffin. Now, yeah. now you're a multimillionaire, billionaire. <laughs> well, the the big thing, I think, it's it's less that um, that's probably the part that doesn't uh, concern too many people. I, I think the bigger issue is that your homeowner's insurance or your renter's insurance probably has a pretty high deductible. And so, it, like, if I went outside and someone stole my two thousand dollar camera, it doesn't necessarily make much sense for me to make a a claim. How high is your deductible? I think my renter's deductible is five hundred. I think when I had yeah. a house, it was a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's what mine is, five hundred. Yeah. Now I do but, have I have a, a coverage called damage to property of others. So I'm thinking I can come to your house and smash some stuff. <laughs> <I'm not> yep, <covered>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got some of that. And also to your point earlier about um, where it covers you, I. Uh, Let's see. I think I noticed in my policy it does say it covers like my stuff all over the world. Sweet. Let's see. Oh yeah. The the first the very first thing in this section on personal property is we cover personal property owned or used by an insured while it is anywhere in the world. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the thing that many people would want and I used to have this for my camera equipment is what's called a personal articles policy. Mhm. And the main reason you would want this is, one, it gets you a, usually a much lower deductible. Like, you can get a deductible of zero. And you're paying separate from your homeowner's insurance, separate from your renter's insurance, just for that stuff. Gotcha. And when I did it, and now granted I was in Illinois and the prices may differ, and that was this was a few years ago. But back then it was $2.50 per $100 of coverage. And at the time I was covering five thousand dollars worth of camera gear so let's see that was 125 dollars annually not bad yeah which is not bad but that that points out if you're paying for every dollar that you own definitely only insure the stuff that you that would be catastrophic like you know if there's a audio recorder you never use and you actually hate it why include that in yeah. your list of gear that you insure exactly but yeah i guess uh i realize i don't i don't necessarily need coverage for my camera gear but i probably should get liability coverage 
maybe some sort of umbrella policy that protects my stuff and me against against my lawsuits that are surely right. coming <laughs> that are that you're writing out you're working with a lawyer right now <laughs> after after the breakup of the hey indie filmmakers podcast nick bodmer sues griffin hammond <laughs> and i suppose to chris's question if you're renting out your gear you probably could just go to your existing insurance agent if you have renter's insurance or homeowner's insurance and just pose the question to them say look i want to cover my five thousand dollars worth of camera gear and i'm thinking of renting it you know that probably changes the price uh, and just ask them if they have that coverage if they don't if they won't cover you for that kind of thing then maybe go to a specific camera rental company and that's also why sometimes people require deposits right when you rent something you might right. say hey you got, i got to hold a credit card number or something so you have the ability to charge them for the full cost of the camera if it does not return or something right but i kind of feel like if if you're just renting to one video house I mean, I would just talk about it with them. Do they yeah. want to take on the risk? Because if they're willing to say, yeah, if one of our clients break it, then we'll pay you back for the camera. Then I, it sounds like you don't really need insurance. Yep. As long as you have a, an agreement in place. Well, in just a moment, we're going to answer your questions about the hidden mic technique, interlaced video, and putting Nikon lenses on a Panasonic camera. Handy Filmmakers is brought to you by Tongle. Tongle is the creative network where anyone anywhere can make content for brands and get paid. And if you go to tongle.com slash projects to see what's available right now, one of the ones you'll see is the YouTube pilot portal, which is actually Tongle looking for content for their own YouTube channel. And the way it works is you can create a pilot for some sort of content that would live on their YouTube channel, if they like the show that you've created, they'll either buy it outright from you or they'll ask you to make more in that series and they'll help you develop that. So I encourage you to check out the YouTube pilot portal on Tongle, see if you can come up with a great idea for their channel and uh, you can get paid for your work. Get all the details by visiting tongle.com slash projects. That's T-O-N-G-A-L dot com slash projects. Nick, do you want to read our first comment? It's a good Halloween comment. Ooh, okay. We have a YouTube comment from Matt Haslam Productions. Hey, guys, I'm fil filming a couple of Halloween parades in the coming weeks and was wondering if you guys had any tips. I'm planning to have a GoPro Hero 5 shooting 4K wide up on a light stand eight feet off the ground and have a Canon DSLR filming the close-ups of the floats. Do you guys have any tips on how to film an event like this? That's a great idea to put a GoPro on a light stand yeah get it up and get a better kind of a more interesting yeah. angle right although i would say depending on the weight of your light stand uh, i mean a light stand is in, usually intended to carry a lot of weight i mean i hope it's not like a c stand that'd be really heavy but you might be able to get away with just something lightweight like a like a broomstick like a hollow aluminum broomstick from a store and that might be a little bit easier on your your arms but yeah. I've seen this this shot before. You can kind of get what looks like a drone shot by just putting a GoPro on a stick. Oh, so you're it, thinking he's going to manually hold this light stand? Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, you're right. I guess he's talking about just putting it up. I, I see, yeah. I thought he was just going to put it up there and put it up high and just let it roll while he shoots close-ups. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. I guess I've seen this, like, stick shot before, and I love it so much that you might want to try that, too. <laughs> So it's you, like so you're saying get the get the GoPro out, you know, on an angle on a long arm and move it as if it's a fancy dolly shot or something. Right, and the or GoPro jib. is so wide. Yeah, the GoPro is so wide that you really don't even have to be that high above people for it to feel like you're really high up. So, I guess whether you you put it on a light stand or or not, I wouldn't put it well, he's talking about eight feet off the ground. That's probably a, a pretty good height. I wouldn't go higher than that because it'll just look really distant. But if you go right above people, it'll be a pretty cool shot. Yeah, that sounds neat. And the other thing I would do with the GoPro is I haven't used a Hero 5. I think actually a Hero 3 or 4 might be the last one I've used. I would guess that by now in 4K you can shoot a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. I guess I don't know for certain. But if it's possible to get the resolution you want, but shoot a wider field of view in 4x3 rather than 16x9, that might be good because with a parade, you don't know where something might happen. And maybe it happens a little bit above 
your normal 16 by 9 framing or a little bit below. And if you shoot with the full sensor, you have some choices later on where you crop it. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. What Anytime I'm shooting stuff, I don't, I'm not like looking at the camera. I like to shoot that way. What about uh, the close-up camera? I mean, that that should be relatively easy, except that I'm thinking at a parade, it's always hard to get a good vantage point, people crowding around in front of you. Yep. So I would say either make sure you're the first person in the row or see if you can get up high or something to make sure you're getting good shots. But it sounds like a good setup. Having two cameras, he'll have coverage to edit the thing down, and you know you can almost make a montage without it feeling like, you know, without jump cuts and all of that. Yep. Here's an email we got from Dennis. He emailed me because he was having trouble with my hidden mic technique. From last episode, we saw how you put a microphone in a shot and then make it go away. Yeah. And he followed the step-by-step, you know, he, he duplicated the clip in the timeline, found a part of the clip that didn't have a microphone, and then he drew a mask around that area. And then what happened, he plays it back and he sees the microphone still. So can you guess what he did wrong? Uh, I would guess that he's got his layers reversed. That's exactly what I was thinking, that uh, there is a invert button in both Final Cut and Premiere that lets you set a mask and then you can just change are we seeing what's inside the mask or are we seeing what's outside the mask so that's what I assumed I, I asked him you know did you click click that invert button see if that makes a difference and it still didn't he was still seeing the mic well then I would be interested to know if he really had a clean uh, plate behind it or if he was playing the same video well yeah he did find a clean section but I think what was happening is that his clean section was maybe only five seconds long Mm -hmm. and he was trying to cover up an eight second shot so it was working for the beginning and then eventually the mic was coming back in and at first because he's doing all these layers and stuff and masks it it was confusing to him where where it was was coming coming from from. yeah yeah so what he ended up doing I, i told him he could he was talking about doing a freeze frame and so i told him how to do a freeze frame in final cut you can actually just hit option f on any clip and it will create a freeze frame he, I think he, that's what he did, uh, but I also suggested you can slow down the whole clip, uh-huh. hit Command-R. Retime it. Yeah, just slow the whole thing down. Or what I actually like to do, I like to keep the speed the same, and I don't want to do a freeze frame because I want to see the normal noise level in the shot moving. Uh, so I would have just taken that same clip, cut out the part where the mic is, and then just make a copy of it and reverse it. Yep. So you play one part forward, then one part backward, then you could just loop that for as long as you need to go. Makes sense to me. Makes sense. You got it, Griffin Hammond. (laughs) Nice. We got a YouTube comment from One Man, One Camera. What's the difference between AVC HD interlaced and AVC HD progressive? He's got a Panasonic G7, and he's got the option to shoot both. Uh, What do you think? Well, AVC HD, first of all, that's just H.264, right? That Yeah, AVC HD is the container. And again, I think last episode or two episodes, we talked about containers versus codecs. Um, it's going to be an H.264 codec in an AVC HD container. And I think, I, I guess I don't know exactly which formats the AVC HD refers to, but I'm wondering if it's lower bit rate, because I think at least on the G, on the Panasonic cameras, it usually refers to like the 20 megabit recording as AVC HD, and it usually refers to the higher bit rate recording as MOV or MP4. Yep. But it's all it's all the same codec, it's just different bit rates. So interlaced versus progressive, I was just having this conversation the other day because it's funny how how much we're still locked into like the origin of television, <laughs> yep. even though we're, <laughs> we're so many years later. Like... I shoot everything in progressive now. Interlaced is just the way that televisions all used to operate. You know how interlaced works, right? Yeah, basically it shows every other line of video at any given time, and it kind of rotates back and forth. Yeah, you almost get like a... It's almost like a higher perceived resolution because you're mixing two frames together. Mm -hmm. So if we show you a little bit of the frame before on half the lines on the TV and we show you half the lines from the next frame uh, together in this interlaced frame. It just 
feels like more information, I guess. It looks sharper. Well, on and old you know, TVs. Old, old cathode ray tube TVs would would literally have to draw each line as it goes down the screen, right? So it does it, I guess, faster, right? If it's only doing every other line, and then right. switches over uh, to to the to the second set. And TVs still support interlaced, and I think I think even some HD sports are still presented in like sixty i mm-hmm. uh, interlaced sixty frames per second interlaced. Um, so it still exists and it still works on TVs, but if you shoot it, if you shoot interlaced on your camera and then you go to the web, that's where it can look problematic because our computer monitors are not interlaced. Right. In and gen- so when you play in general, pick progressive, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you mostly see this problem. You go, you put it on YouTube and then you just notice a little bit of like tearing or your, banding type type of, yeah, you see the bands and yeah. you, you really only notice it in, in, Motion. There's lots of movement. Yeah. yeah. But for film and web, stick with progressive. Here's a YouTube comment we got from Michael Turner, who's wondering if it's okay to fi- submit more than one film to the same film festival and wondering if I've ever done that. Uh, he's at the process where he has a few films and he's entering several film festivals and just wondering if that's like bad form. I have no idea. So I'm going to ask you, Griffin Hammond, what's the answer? I, I don't know, you know, I don't run a film festival. It's up to them, but it does feel like it would cause some weird issues. Like, I'm going to a film festival this week. I'm actually going to be in Canada for the Devour Food Film Festival. Cool. In fact, if anyone is in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, I'll be around uh, Wednesday through Friday. But uh, I'm just going to plug that real quick. I'm Griffin. Yeah. <laughs> so... In this film festival, I'm actually, this is actually a special weird food film festival where they're actually only going to play my five minute film in my program. And then they have like a, a speaker afterward uh, about cocktails. So that works out pretty nicely. But for most film festivals with a short film, like when you and I went to Utah, mm-hmm. they played my film as part of a program of what, like six other films? Yep. And at the end, we all get up and we do a, a, a Q&A. So I imagine it would feel kind of weird to the audience if your, fi- your both your films got into the same program. <laughs> the Griffin like, Hammond show. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it would. It might feel a little bit unfair, uh, even if it's not. I mean, even if your films were both great and they both needed to fit in that program, I could see a film festival not wanting to do that because the audience would be kind of confused. Although it wouldn't be that weird to put two of your films in two different programs. So really, I mean, but he's talking about just submitting to, I mean, you can really let the festival decide what's appropriate at that point. But right. you, I mean, if you've got two films that you're happy with and think are appropriate for the festival, why not submit them both and let the festival decide, you yeah. know, if that makes sense to have both or maybe one fits and the other doesn't. And, you know, I guess you're doubling your chances, right? Exactly. Yeah. You never know what they're going to pick. I mean, you might have one film that you think is definitely better. But the other film might be a better fit for what they are starting to program. You know, maybe they are doing a food category and one of your films is about that. See, I don't think it can hurt to enter both. I don't think they'll be offended that you enter both. But I I would be, I would think it'd be rare to get both in. Because, you know, the film festival wants to bring lots of different filmmakers and bring, and you're going to bring an audience with you. And if they are selecting only your films, they're not like, you know, they're not getting the benefit of bringing more new people in. Yes, indeed. We've got an email from Hugh, who's got an interesting question. He's using a Metabone Speed Booster with his GH5 along with his full-frame Nikon F-mount Rokinon Sin Prime lenses. Did I say any of that right? Uh, you said Rokinon right, and then it's Cine. Cine. Or- Prime lenses, lenses. thank you, Uh, which he originally purchased for his Nikon D810. Um, He's saying his GH5 viewfinder no longer displays F numbers, nor does it display the whole numbers like 1 through 8, but rather a strange little exposure indicator at the bottom of the viewfinder that looks more like some kind of ISO scale. The marks appear and disappear as the exposure changes when I open and close the iris. What is going on there, Griffin? Do you know? (laughs) Yeah, I do. All right. In fact... I wrote back to Hugh. I was like, it sounds like your camera's working exactly as it's supposed to. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, this is the problem I have with the Metabone Speed Booster is that in a lot of cases with the lenses that you're using, uh, 
uh, the GH5 doesn't, it loses the electronic communication that it may have with some lenses. In fact, I actually don't know about these Cine lenses. Uh, maybe there was never a, an electronic communication anyway. But because of the speed booster, the camera can't, it doesn't know what aperture you're shooting at. And you have a manual iris on the lens. So you can change that ex- that that aperture and the exposure. And all the camera knows I mean, it's showing nothing for the f-stop because it doesn't know that. But it is showing that little exposure meter on the bottom of the screen. Right. Okay, yep. And I think he was a little bit confused about the exposure meter, having not used one before, because he was kind of thinking, like, well, it's a pretty worthless little meter. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. Let's actually look at mine right now. Let's see what mine is, is saying. So mine is... Is, is showing that my exposure is, on average, a little bit below zero. And mine is showing mine, on average, is just a little above zero. But that's because I've got an open window right here, I think, is, is blowing yeah. out a little bit. So, And all that means is it's, it's kind of like the histogram. It's just looking at every single pixel on the camera, and it's just saying, in my case, most of them are a little bit darker than normal. But... Really, I want to expose for my face, my skin, and my skin is properly exposed right now, so I know everything is okay. And I use other tools like zebra stripes to make sure skin tones are exposed properly. Uh, and the exposure meter is just kind of like, it's good for when you're, you've flipped open your LCD, you're outside in the sun, and it's kind of hard for you to tell what you're shooting, and you can just know real quick, just tell me the average, you know, how's my camera doing? So yeah, he should definitely use those other tools when using his cine lens. Histogram, my friend, histogram. That's what Actually, I like he to likes use. the he likes the waveform, which is oh, even fancier. more information than yeah. uh, than the histogram. I don't think my camera will do the waveform, so. No, yours won't. But yeah, the GH5 added it. It's oh. new for that camera. Griffin's will, but not my poor. Little Although I never camera. use it, it takes up a lot of space on the screen, and I find that. I do get a lot of questions from people about like how to expose properly and how to use the histogram and the and the waveform and those things are useful. I think especially if you're new to um, if you're new to a camera, those are helpful tools. But I think once I've gotten used to a camera, like I've been shooting with the GH series for so long, I kind of know what I'm getting uh, with these cameras. So I'm I'm okay with just the little exposure meter on the bottom. And some zebra stripes. Beautiful. We did it. We did it again. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Hammond. Episode 39 in the bag. Yeah. Do we I get a party uh, for episode 40? Like, are you gonna send me balloons or flowers or something? Yeah, 40 is kind of a kind of a milestone next week. Um, yeah. We should do something special. Yeah. We I, I will be back from Canada. Okay. You'll still be in Vegas. I will still be in Vegas. Cool. Cool. Well, have a happy Halloween, everybody. Yeah. Use some, use some evil white balance. Yeah. Put some gels on your lights and white balance weird. <laughs> yeah, if you're doing a, a client project, just say, oh, you know, it's near Halloween, so I made it all spooky. Didn't you want that? Yeah. That interview you do with the CEO, it just has to look weird because it's Halloween week. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, my friend. I'm going to run. Take care. I'll talk, talk to you later. later. Bye. My window is open, and they are tearing up the road outside, and they just started. <laughs> oh, so like it's about to get bad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly.